On the Learn Liberty YouTube channel, this guy, Matt Zwanski, has a video about how under capitalism, workers are not exploited. So we're going to go through his video and critique it to see if we can counter his arguments. Karl Marx famously thought that a capitalist economy promotes the systematic exploitation of workers. For Marx, this idea was based on a labor theory of value, which most scholars today reject. So he starts off talking about the labor theory of value, but then instead of actually saying anything about it, he just tells us that scholars reject it. And then he just moves on. What he's not telling his audience is that this is an old argument, where people who pointed out that capitalism is exploitation would prescribe to a labor theory of value, whereas people who do not believe capitalism is exploitive would have a subjective theory of value. Now this argument of whether or not value is objective or subjective may seem um, abstract or some bizarre philosophical tangent that's not really relevant. But as we'll go into, it's really central to this concept of exploitation under capitalism. This argument goes back to the middle of the 1800s at the start of the Industrial Revolution. This is the age where we had the real true free market compared to today. And people working crazy hours for basically subsistence wages in factories. You know, while Marx did certainly write an awful lot about how the actual value of stuff comes from workers' labor, it really was inevitable that we would have thinkers backlash against this um, brutal system. Because there was this basic problem that we had all this new technology, we were able to produce more, but the end result of this seemed to be the immiseration of a large working class. To go over the labor theory of value in a very quick and superficial way, we could say that if a, hypothetically a worker puts in 12 hours a day, then six hours of work goes to produce enough to earn back his or her wages. But the latter six hours go to surplus value, which is um, it goes to the profit of the owner. But now that we're on the subject of surplus value, we need to go over a little bit about what exactly value is. When capitalism apologists talk about value, they don't actually define it. They just have some vague notion that there is something called value out there, and they just claim that it is subjective. They claim that how much a pen is worth is their subjective opinion. How much a car is worth is someone's subjective opinion. Everything is just your subjective opinion about how much it's worth. For Marx, there were different types of value. There was the use value, which is the actual, you know, what we can use something for. There was the exchange value, which was kind of like how much would something be worth in, in market exchange. There's the actual price, which is how much something sells for, which Marx um, differentiated from exchange value, which is very important to Marx, but not really relevant to the capitalism apologist, who just kind of lumps everything together under this subject of um, subjective value. You know, and finally, Marx did mention things that um, really are kind of outside of his theory of the labor theory of value because there are things of subjective value that are bought for and sold under capitalism, such as honor, um, how much money, for example, does it take to bribe a politician to vote for a law in your favor and so forth. So there are things of subjective value. Marx was concerned with the capitalistic mode of production and where exchange value of commodities comes from within the capitalistic mode of production. So the labor theory of value does not concern itself with how much does it cost to buy you off a politician, how much is someone's loyalty worth, or how much is some old family um, photograph or jewelry worth because of the emotional attachment. He was concerned with the objective value of things that are produced under the capitalistic mode of production, under commodity production in the new industrial age. And for Marx, he brought this down to um, being related to the amount of socially necessary labor time it took to produce on a, co a commodity. 
So it's there. So therefore, the exchange value is objective in that it is linked to this real world objective phenomenon of human labor going in to produce a commodity. The more human labor it takes to produce a, com and a commodity, then the more exchange value would have and the less socially necessary labor it takes to produce it, the less value would have. Now, capitalism apologists have long debunked the labor theory of value by not actually answering it, but just coming up with bad straw man arguments against it. For example, they have the famous mud pie example, where they show that if someone produces a mud pie, then they're not producing anything of value because it's basically worthless and unsellable. Therefore, they say, see, all this labor wanted to producing a mud pie, but we don't have anything of value. Therefore, the labor theory of value is debunked. Of course, they throw out the entire notion of socially necessary labor time. Just putting lots of labor into some endeavor, which is not socially necessary, is not producing anything of exchange value. Other ways that the labor theory of value can be said to be debunked is that capitalism apologists will apply to things which are outside of commodity production, such as how much money does it take to bribe a politician? Well, it's true that this cannot be explained through an objective theory of labor uh, value. It, this is outside of what the labor theory of value is really supposed to describe. So it's besides the point, it's irrelevant. Or the capitalism apologist might point out the discrepancy between the actual amount of labor time that goes into commodity production and the sales price. This is something that Marx and other people who pushed forward a labor theory value understood and that they, they did account for this. But it's just simply the capitalism apologist who does not go into labor theory um, philosophy whatsoever and just looks for any way to dismiss it. They will say this without really taking everything into account. The real reason why the labor theory of value has largely been rejected is because it's politically inconvenient. If we have a world where workers make stuff of objective value, then isn't it exploitation for them to have so little of it while we have a couple of people at the top who just pre, um, collect more and more wealth benefiting from the labor of so many? So the capitalist answer to this is to say, fuck you, everything is subjective, now shut up and go to work. The capitalism apologists insist that we are nothing but exchanges of subjective values. So fuck you and your concept of exploitation. The capitalism apologists will insist that the actual value of your labor is subjective. And they insist that the value of what you produce is also subjective. It's all just random opinion. How much is your labor worth? How much is the stuff you produced worth? And if you and if we have millions and millions of people going to work in factories while only a handful of people at the very top prosper, well then fuck you if you think there's exploitation over here because this is all subjective and everyone is just exchanging things that they subjectively think are of equal value. So shut up and go to work. To learn more information about the labor theory of value and erroneous critiques of it and why you should care about the labor theory of value, I will refer you to go to the Law of Value series on YouTube by Brendan McCooney. See, see the link below in video description. This series is amazing and everyone should watch it. Nevertheless, many still agree with Marx's basic claim that capitalism is inherently exploitative. They simply define exploitation in broader and less contentious terms. Instead of thinking about exploitation as involving the forced extraction of surplus value from labor, contemporary philosophers define it as taking unfair advantage of others' vulnerability. And defined in this way, many philosophers think that contemporary capitalism is rife with exploitation, with economically powerful capitalists taking unfair advantage of workers' vulnerability in order to maximize their profit. Sky's using this odd arguing technique where he's basically saying that the real arguments against what he's saying are somehow already disproven, already known to be illegitimate, therefore you can't make those arguments. But under capitalism, you don't have a voluntary choice of if you want to go to work and sell your labor for wages. You are compelled 
by the system to sell your labor for wages so you can earn stuff to survive. Therefore, capitalism forces people to go to work so that surplus value can be um, extracted from them. Capitalism is a class system that has the forced extraction of surplus value from labor. That's what you have under the commodity production. So I, I don't see why this point should be um, seated at all. So what should we make of this argument? Is capitalism exploitative? And what's the alternative? Well, first, it's absolutely correct that many capitalists want to exploit workers. They want to pay as low a wage as possible and get as much work out of workers as possible in order to maximize profit. But the fact that other capitalists also want to exploit workers in this way makes it difficult for any of them to do so. This is because competitive pressure forces capitalists to pay workers close to the value of what those workers produce, whether they want to or not. If you try to pay someone less than their worth, someone else will offer them more because they can profit by doing so. Imagine you're in an auction bidding against others for a dollar. Of course, you'd like to pay as little as possible for that dollar. But if someone else was bidding 60 cents for it, wouldn't it be worth your while to bid 62? And wouldn't someone else then bid 64 and so on? In a competitive marketplace, that same process leads capitalists to pay workers close to the value of what they produce, not because they want to, but because they have to. I shouldn't have to mention this except to point out the audacity that this guy has, his confirmation bias to only select um, you know, a few situations, but the vast majority of, of the situation, which is that we have billions of people on planet Earth who don't have suitable employment, you know, that doesn't matter to him because, you know, Kobe Bryant is going to get the best um, deal from whatever basketball team wants to pay him because, you know, he has a special skill. And because Kobe Bryant is getting paid all this money under capitalism, the billions of people who don't have jobs to pay them, you know, that, that's irrelevant. The fact that you can only volunteer for a job and get paid if there is something to volunteer for, you know, that doesn't matter to him. The long history of there being a vast underclass of impoverished people working for subsistence wages, that doesn't matter to him. The fact that regardless of what happened in the past, even if it was functional in the past, due to technological unemployment, there aren't enough jobs to go around, and that situation is only going to get worse, that doesn't matter to him. He probably has no concept of technological unemployment. The second point to keep in mind about capitalism and exploitation is this. Even when exploitative or unfair exchanges do take place, the institutions of a free market ensure that they will at least usually be mutually beneficial because the exchanges are voluntary. As an example, think about an exchange that a lot of people find unfair, payday loans. A poor working man needs money right now to meet his basic needs and so gets a loan from a payday loan store, but only by paying fees equivalent to a 400% annual percentage rate. That's grand, at least for the sake of argument that charging such a high interest rate is unfair. Even so, it's important to bear in mind that both parties had the opportunity to say no to the exchange if they believed that they could do better somewhere else. And because of this fact, because the exchange was voluntary in just this very weak sense, this means that both parties expect to gain more from the exchange than they give up. It means that unless one of them has made a mistake, the exchange will be mutually beneficial. Okay, let's use this analogy. We say two people are in prison, one has cigarettes, the other has bubble gum, so they decide to voluntarily trade the gum for the cigarettes, and both of them are going to be better off because of that transaction. How does that justify them being in the institution of prison to begin with? How does that justify erecting that institution of prison? I mean, you're within the narrow context that trade is mutually beneficial. It doesn't mean anything else beyond that. Likewise, under capitalism, we can have a transaction between two people that is mutually beneficial. But in what way, how does that justify using capitalism as the mode of economic transactions on planet Earth, given the current state of resources, our technology, and ob satisfying objective human needs? It doesn't. He's basically saying a lot of nothing. This is an important fact. 
important for the well-being of individual laborers, and important for the growth and development of society as a whole. Mutually beneficial exchanges are how wealth is created in society. What the fuck did he just say? Mutually beneficial exchanges are how wealth is created in society. That's like the stupidest thing ever. You don't go out and buy stuff and therefore create wealth. You don't create anything by buying stuff. When was the last time you went to a store to buy sneakers or something and you said, I want to buy sneakers, and through that process, sneakers materialized into existence? You know, the act of mutually beneficial exchange, or what he really means is buying stuff, doesn't create anything. All it does is move things around. The actual act of wealth creation, as he phrased, that happens in the act of production, not in the exchange. I understand that within the capitalistic system, you're not actually going to produce any commodities unless they are being produced for the intent of exchanging it. But nonetheless, you do not produce anything by exchange. You produce by production. And the actual way production is going to happen is going to vary depending upon the economic system in place. Additionally, if wealth creation happens through exchange, then exchange over anything will create wealth. Like someone has cancer, we have some sick and dying people in a hospital. But we really need more sick and dying people to raise GDP and get more um, wealth because we're going to have to go through more exchanges to provide these people with drugs and surgeries and who knows whatever else that they may need. There's a disconnect between the so social wealth, social benefit, and wealth in terms of monetary wealth. One has little to do with the other, and he just doesn't seem to understand that at all. He just kind of equates it all. He says, wealth is mutually beneficial exchange. I mean, it's just one non sequitur after another. I'm not being facetious. In capitalism, a problem is not something to solve to help the, the society. A problem is something to capitalize on. So whether it's health care or a drug problem, the war on drugs, or security problems, or cars that break down, um, whatever it is that's a problem, there is no motive to fix it. The only motive is to service the problem to get more money. So we have within a very narrow frame of reference lots of mutually beneficial exchanges, but the system as a whole is not seeking to solve any problems. It's just seeking to make sure that people need to keep on servicing their problems. So his frame of reference is extremely narrow. And the more wealth a society creates over time, the less vulnerability there is for capitalists to exploit. Look at this massive amount of electronic garbage. He's basically saying that we need to have more production and more of these so-called mutually beneficial exchanges and just circle more and more and more stuff around. We live on a finite planet with finite resources. How is his infinite growth model going to work on a finite planet? Um, I'd like him to actually answer that. Markets aren't perfect, but whether or not you think capitalism is exploitative, you need to ask, what's the alternative? The usual suggestion is political regulation and control. But if our concern is to minimize exploitation, we need to ask whether this alternative really makes sense. After all, citizens are in a position of tremendous vulnerability relative to the state. And lobbyists, bureaucrats, and elected officials will often be tempted to exploit that vulnerability for their own private gain. Think of the way in which our political institutions subsidize large agribusinesses, bail out auto companies, cartelize the banking industry through the Federal Reserve System, and so on. All of these policies benefit the interests of the economically powerful and politically well-connected at the expense of ordinary citizens. That's not a free market at work. That's big government. And politics is unlike markets in that political exchanges aren't voluntary. When the government wants to use your money to bail out GM, you don't have the right to say no. And this means there's no guarantee that the exchange will be mutually beneficial. When politics is involved, one party's gain usually comes at someone else's expense. Politicians gain from the contributions they receive from big business, and big business gains from the favors they receive from government. Sure, those favors have a cost, but because government has the power of coercion, it can force third parties to pay that cost. Those who can afford political influence get the benefits, 
and those who cannot afford it suffer the consequences. This is how politics works. And it's not because we have bad people in office and need to get nicer people in. It's because of the structural nature of politics. Because the state has the power to impose its decisions by force on the public. Just hoping that the state will use its power on behalf of the vulnerable isn't enough. We need to ask ourselves, if we really want to reduce the amount of exploitation in the world, is increasing the power of the state really the best way to do it?